Okay, welcome everyone, those of you in person and those of you online as well. Today we are going to hear about the Maputo Protocol assessing the impact of continental agreements on gender rights in Africa. We have a four-person team on this work, two of whom are presenting, and so I'm just going to introduce everyone as per Abinan's request. So our first presenter is Dr. Fabio Pabon, um, who's a postdoctoral researcher at Seldru and a member of ACES South Africa's research node. Fabio's research interests relate to conflict development and economics. His current research interests relate to understanding the mechanisms that bring about a political economy of inequality and conflict in developing countries. Then we have Professor Beno Duro, who is an associate professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Ghana and a member of ACES Ghana node based at the Institute of Statistical Social and economic research at the University of Ghana. Abner is a feminist economist and a former president of the International Association for Feminist Economics. She's published widely in development economics using survey data to analyze issues of assets, wealth, remittances, and education using a gender lens. Then we have Dr. Jody Heyman, who is a distinguished professor of public health at the University of California and a previous dean of the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. She's the founding director of the World Policy Analysis Center, World in Short, which examines health and social policies and outcomes in all 193 UN countries. World's mission is to strengthen equal opportunities worldwide by identifying the most effective public sector approaches, improving the quantity and quality of globally comparative data available, and working in partnerships to support evidence-based improvements in countries worldwide. Then last but not least, we have Dr. Amy Raab, who is Director of Research of um, World Policy Analysis Center and leads World's Research, developing and analyzing quantitative measures of national policy approaches that advance health, economic security, education, and equity in all 193 UN countries, with a deep focus on creating actionable evidence for policymakers and civil society. Over the course of more than a decade and a half at World, Rob has advanced the development of quantitatively comparable indicators that enable the rapid identification of structural inequalities embedded in law, make legal loopholes transparent, support monitoring and accountability for where the countries are meeting their international commitments, and highlight gaps in legal protections that undermine effective implementation and enforcement of fundamental rights. So I'm going to hand over to Fabio, but just to say that this is being recorded and will be available on ACES YouTube channel afterwards. Thank you. Yes. Okay, let me check it again. So let's deal with this small technical issue. Uh, so let's send it to Zoom and see what happens. Uh, so in the meantime, I can just talk a little bit about the team and what we're doing, and we tend to sort out this small glitch that tends to happen on Wednesdays, but that's totally fine. Uh, maybe it's the rain, maybe it's low shedding, we will know. Uh, so what I'm going to talk to you is something that we started to, uh, working with Professor Avena, Amy and Jody like a year ago, like we started to talk about like the Maputo Protocol and gender rights and the, the state of, of gender rights in Africa, right? which to an extent is misinterpreted and misaccounted for. Because it's either assumed that uh, because of the nature of, 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 of Africa, there's no data on that, or that empowerment has been achieved because women are reaching parliamentary seats in the continent. And the reality in the ground is clearly different, right? So what we're trying to do here is try to provide some evidence and information about that. what do we know in terms of legislation, laws, right? And with that, what we do is we can talk about like what is the Maputo protocol, basically the agenda, what we're going to present first. You cannot see it here, but like I can tell you about it, uh, is that we will first mention what is the Maputo protocol food for those that don't know about it. I didn't know about this a year and a half ago, so I can talk about it because I have worked on it. But it's quite important to learn about this protocol that is something that was created by the AU. Then we're trying to understand the role of laws and norms in allowing and creating channels for empowerment and human rights, right? Because when we're talking about gender rights, we're talking about human rights. We're not talking about anything else. The word gender, like people tend to politicize it, but it's humans who have the right to have the same as everyone else, nothing else, 
It's as simple as that, right? So, and then like what we're trying to do then later is talk a little bit about what we're trying to do with the diagnosis that we're building so far, trying to account for some of the provisions, I'll explain later what that means, of the Maputo protocol and their implementation into local legislation in different African countries. And then we'll show like some uh, uh, preliminary evidence with regards to sexual harassment in the workplace and how is that taking place or what evidence do we find about it uh, for the African continent. Uh, Sorry, I think we should go ahead. It's, I can't get Zoom to. Okay. Go well, on the second. But I can do this right, and perhaps people can see it in the small screen, at least. Uh, so basically, what I mentioned is like the agenda that we're going to that we're going to cover today. And so let's talk about it in terms of gender inequality in Africa, right? So, accord, according to different data sources, the inequality between women and men in, in, in Africa is the worst of the world, right? So the, 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 the panorama is a little bit somber, but, and that requires action and requires the capacity for us to understand where things are failing and what could be the possible uh, levers that we could use to facilitate the realization and the enjoyment of human rights, right? And what is interesting is that there's different dimensions of, of gender and the way gender creates inequalities. One of them is income. One that we don't talk a lot is about uh, unpaid care, the social obligations, social norms, who gets to own property, who gets to decide things about the household. And what that brings into light is the notion of intersectional dimensions, right? When you have different obligations that are limiting the enjoyment of your rights, that's where intersectionality kicks in for those who don't are not used to the term intersectionality, right? So just being, being able to understand why are the different dimensions that create barriers for having access to human rights. In, in, in what we're thinking in, the, in, in our analysis, we're thinking about like, there's two elements that are important, uh, and is the role of work and family responsibilities, right? Women get to do more or less, or have to do more or less as opposed to males at the office and at the household, right? and also sexual harassment in the workplace. And those are important to mention because if you think about it, having access to the workplace has implications in terms of your income, in terms of what you can have access to, in terms of ed education, health, and so on, right? So let me talk a little bit about the Maputo Protocol. This is something that was, is called the Maputo Protocol because it was signed in Maputo, Mozambique. But the long name of it is like the Protocol to the African Charter on Humans and people's rights on the rights of women in Africa, right? What is important about this is that the Maputo Protocol speaks about the women of the, the rights of women, but they also speak about the rights of children. And that's extremely important because it brings that intertemporal dimension into the analysis, right? Interestingly enough, the Maputo Protocol start, like was signed in 2003, and so far 44 countries have ratified it. So they say like, okay, we agree with it, we're going to comply with it. So that's the first step of the, of, the, of the process. I will explain that a little bit later, right? And the irony of this is that perhaps given the, the promise of having a charter, an African charter that speaks about the rights of women in the continent, the rights of women in the continent still lack behind the rest of the world, as I show with the data about the Gini Index, right? And something that is quite interesting that, that we came to learn with research on this topic is that the Maputo Protocol by design was talking about intersectionality without using the term. They were considering all the limitations that African women tend to face with regards to their rights and their, their, the enjoyment of their human rights. And that is quite interesting because before the word intersectionality was mainstream, there's legal provisions that were designed by Africans within the African Union trying to consider how these different factors take place. The other thing that is quite interesting within the Maputo protocol to consider is that they talk about gender as opposed to sex. So they allow different expressions of, of gender and identity and the discrimination of other groups that could be labeled differently under other circumstances, right? Um, let me see what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, okay, so something that is important about this is that the, the protocol has 23 different articles that we can show it in the next one. Oh, sorry, so like we're competing for the computer. 
That's totally fine. So what is interesting, and this is when I'm, I'm, I'm raising the issue about how intersectional the protocol is, right? When you see about the provisions that are enshrined in the different articles of the protocol, it goes from the right of elderly women, the right of disabled people, the right to, the right to own property, the right to decide, thank you, or thanks, thanks, like a marriage right, a being protected from conflict, you know? rights to education. So it's extremely comprehensive, right? Because it's encompassing in a way, it's conceptualizing the challenges that are faced by women on multiple dimensions. So if you think this as a, as a, as a, as a game, this is a game of all these traps, are the different traps that women have to jump to get better rights and access to the rights, right? So the fact that they are listing these barriers is quite interesting. Okay, go, go back now. And, and that, that makes it extremely useful for trying to figure out how policy can be related to this, right? But remember, this is an international treaty. So when we talk about international treaties, we need to understand something that is, one thing is what is signed in the African Union, another thing is what the countries ratified that they say, like, I will respect what we promised. And then you need to operationalize that process. So that means you have to make it into local law and kind of like adjusted to your own context in relation to your previous legislation. I know I sound like a lawyer, but that's the way law sounds, right? And, and but that what opens is a gateway because without the law, if you say I have human rights, but I'm not recognized as a human or my rights are not recognized by the constitution, it is extremely difficult to make your case, right? And it happens, but after a lot of time, the case of apartheid illustrated, the case of segregation in the US illustrates that. But what is important about this is that it makes it clear for the continents and the different uh, governments in the African continent about what are the rights that should be enjoyed by African women. And it opens that ga gateway. So we're trying to see how, how well are these doors positioned to try to analyze further if this relates to better enjoyment of different rights related to these provisions or general development, right? So an example of this, and that's why I spoke about the procedural and the value of the gateway for, for having legislation to have human rights, right? But also like the importance of laws and legislation is that they can affect and condition social norms, right? The way we behave, where we respect the robot or, or, or the, the traffic light during traffic, et cetera, right? And this has implications in what rights we can enjoy or we cannot. For example, if I, if, if, if I am a male, if my partner gets pregnant and I'm in high school, I can still attend the school. But if the right for my partner to go to school because she's also in high school, is not guaranteed into the law, she will be kicked out of the educational system, right? And it's because of social norms. So the protection of the right of someone to attend and enjoy a right becomes really important. And it becomes important in different dimensions. Here we're just making the case or what, what happens with relation to asset ownership, having the right to access property, right? So we're comparing three different places, Ecuador, Ghana, and a province in India called Karnakata, Karnataka, sorry. Uh, and what we're doing is looking at three things, right? The first thing is we're just trying to see the share of physical assets, think of households, and the ownership, right? Then what we notice in this graph is that in the case of Ecuador, Close to half of the of, 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 of married women have half of the property. Close. Not perfect, but getting there, right? Whereas when we check the case of Ghana and India, it's far less. They will, I'll explain that later. When it comes to financial, it seems to be a little bit more even, right? Because it seems like people can have access to money. But we are forgetting two things. The first thing is that the price and the value of the asset, right? So we're comparing houses with cash. So when you average these two, what you figure out is that in fact, the fact that like women in Ecuador had access to the household enabled greater access to physical and financial assets on average. The difference between Ecuador, Ghana, and Karnakata, Karnataka, sorry, is that the law doesn't enshrine the right to own property. And this also makes the case for inheritance, right? If my father or my mother passed away, and I am a woman, and by law, not all of us have the same right to own property, I lose the possibility from going to here to go to here. 
right? And that also like talks about what happens within the marriage. If a, if a married couple, one of the partners passes away, let's say the male passes away, and I am the woman, I wouldn't in some cases, if that is not enshrined into the law, have access to the asset in which I lived, and most likely I helped to, I helped to build, right? So it illustrates how the laws condition social norms and enables economic outcomes that can have clear implications on development and the enjoyment of human rights, right? Not only of the person that is affected, but the people around that community, right? <clears throat> so this is something that I mentioned before, uh, and it's the role of international law as a catalyst for this, right? And what we're saying is like law by itself is, is not sufficient, but it's necessary because it can enable action. It can enable civil society organizations to come into the party. It can enable governments to try to improve what they do when, they, when they're failing to do so, because they're trying to comply with their mandates as governments in some cases, right? And then what we make is the distinction between international agreements, a human rights agreements like the Maputo Protocol, the national leg legislative, that is how when you ratify it and the, government, and the country says, we will implement this protocol in country X, right? And then you try to make it into national law. But then you need to go into a step further, operationalizing that international local mandate into policy and practice, right? And what does that mean for the population of that country? So let me, let me point out here at something that is really interesting. <clears throat> and it's one of the things that we have found so far. And it's when you check the legal frameworks addressing gender equality or inequality, it seems like Africa doesn't have anything, you know? So it goes with the stereotype that Africa is a barren land, Africa doesn't have institutions, doesn't have missions, but this, and this data to make it a little bit more dramatic is from UN women. And this is wrong because there's data, thanks to the data from the World Policy Center that shows that like there's legislation where the legislation is being implemented and operationalized effectively it's a different discussion. But Africa has ta taken steps with regards to child marriage, with regards to uh, uh, female genital mutilation, with regards to children's rights that we need to account for if we want to understand the development outcomes associated with those interventions. Or what we're trying to guess something without having the right information for that, right? So what we're trying to do is something fairly basic so far, because we're just trying to map what is like the Maputo Protocol translation into national law currently? How far is it going so far? What countries are implementing it? And to what degree, right? Because one thing is what the country promises, another thing is how it does it into practice and how much it enforces that right, right? According to the law, the practice is always a little bit tricky. And also like, that's what we call comprehensiveness. How well is law protecting a person's human rights according to what the government promised in Addis Ababa to the EU, right? And with that, what we're trying to aim is to create a series of quantitative indicators that could help us to moni monitor the domestication of the protocol, but also could be a tool for civil society actors, academics, researchers, and governments that want to move this uh, process further and identify, uh, as, as my colleagues from the World Policy Center said yesterday, the gaps that need to be fixed for this. And on that note, I leave it to my prof. Thank you very much. Okay, so what we're going to do next is um, provide you with some information on um, the domestication, progress in the domestication of the Maputo Protocol. And we're going to be making use of data um, from the World Policy Analysis Center, which constructs quantitative measures of laws and policies for 193 countries over a wide range of areas. And basically um, what we have done in trying to assess the extent to which national legislation has been domesticated, um, um, has domesticated the guarantees of the Maputo Protocol is to focus on five articles. And these are articles on marriage, the right to education and training, economic and social welfare rights, special protection of elderly women, and special protection of women with disabilities. So we have focused um, on these um, five um, articles of the Maputo Protocol.
And within those five areas of the protocol, we have been able to identify eight policy areas of focus for analysis, which you can see on the screen. And what we are going to be um, looking at now in terms of letting you um, showing what we have done is to focus on one particular um, policy area, and that is sexual harassment in the workplace. So basically, um, what did we um, do? For each of the policy areas, we have eight policy areas, and each policy area has provisions, and I will illustrate it soon. And so for each of the provisions for each country, we score the country. We score the country to find out to what extent it has translated the provision into law. So the country is going to be coded zero for a particular provision if it has not um, translated um, the um, provision into law, or if it so happens that it has on its books legislation indeed, which is promoting inequality as opposed to uh, inequality and discrimination as opposed to gender equality. A country is coded as one for a provision if they've taken initial steps to translate the provision of the protocol into law, but these steps fall short of guaranteeing equality of women and girls. It is coded two if there is at least some coverage of the provision in national law, and it is coded as three if the national law guarantees the rights articulated in the protocol. So this is what we do for each provision in a policy area. So once we have gotten um, the scores um, for each provision in the policy area, basically what we do is, and we find the mean value, okay? And um, since we are coding from um, zero um, to three, it means that the mean value um, could either be zero or anywhere between zero and three. And the closer is this mean value, which we, which we are describing as the Maputo Protocol Index for the policy area, the closer it is to three, then the more likely it is that the country's legislation is um, providing women with a comprehensive set of guaranteed rights in the policy area. So we are going to illustrate using sexual harassment in the workplace. But first of all, let us look at the article in the um, Maputo Protocol, and it's Article 13C. And it says, ensure transparency in recruitment, promotion, and dismissal of women and what we are interested in, combat and punish sexual harassment in the workplace. So this is data that we've gotten from the world um, policy analysis. And we find, we don't have a pointer, do we? No. Now, yeah. so we find under the description, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six different um, provisions, if I would call it that, under the policy area of um, sexual harassment in the workplace. And so indeed, if one is providing um, protection for anybody in the workplace against sexual harassment, you want to make sure that, well, we've got um, sexual um, harassment well-defined and we are as comprehensive as possible in the areas that we want um, protected. We want to also make sure that we comprehensively um, define the possible um, perpetrators. Um, we also um, want um, to know that it's not only people who may be employed in the workplace who could be covered, but even people who may not be employed in the workplace but doing business <clears throat> in the workplace may also um, be protected against sexual har um, harassment within the workplace. We want to make sure that employers are taking the required steps um, to end so, um, sexual harassment, and that the law is going to be holding employers legally responsible for sexual harassment in the workplace. And very important, you find in many of these sexual harassment cases, there is no reporting because of the fear of retaliation. So you want to make sure that the law is um, um, providing protection um, for those um, who would report instances of um, sexual harassment so that um, they don't suffer re um, retaliation. So the year of the data is um, 2021 in terms of the laws that were in place by 2021. So we have our scoring, <clears throat> zero, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, zero, one, two, and three. So of course, as we said, if you haven't 
put in place any of the provisions, then there is going to, you're going to get um, a zero score. But if in the case of um, perpetrators covered um, by um, workplace sexual harassment, if the law only covers supervisors or people in a position of authority and doesn't, for example, cover include also co-workers, then you're going to get a score of one. And if um, retaliation is only protection from termination for individuals who report and doesn't provide wide um, spread and um, protection, then you're going to be getting a one. So it, it means then that one has to, which is what our colleagues at the World Policy Analysis Center have done, gone through the laws, understood them, coded them, making it possible for us to be able to do this sort um, of analysis. So here we go, this is what we found um, for the um, African countries under the different um, provisions that we think are, are required for a country to provide effective um, protection against sexual harassment in the workplace. Now, the color orange, which is the very first, that is prohibition of retaliation for reporting or participating in investigations of workplace sexual harassment. We find 25 African countries don't provide any such protection. The laws don't contain any protections against um, 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 retaliation. And it's only 11 countries that have fully, um, fully protect against retaliation um, in their laws. And in terms of the employer required to prevent sexual harassment at work, we find 40 countries don't have that requirement that the employer is required to prevent sexual um, harassment at work. And it's only seven um, countries in which we find that um, the, um, the laws require that the employers um, put into, uh, are putting into place specific measures to um, prevent um, sexual um, harassment at work. So as you can see, we've used our scoring um, to be able to um, rate um, the different African countries. So based on, remember um, I had said that once we, we um, rate all the separate provisions for the individual country, we then find a mean, okay, across the um, different provisions. So we, have, we, we calculate the mean for each country for, um, under this policy area, the mean, um, the mean score. And then we have made the, we then say, that if a country has a mean score of two and above, then we can say that the country has domesticated the, um, um, this um, policy area of the Maputo Protocol into law because it has having a score of two means that there is a, a good amount of the translation of the different um, provisions um, into the law of the country. And so this is the information um, that we have here, where we have information for, I think the white is Western Sahara, and I forget what the other, um, whether it's Guinea-Bissau, can't remember what the other country is, for which we don't have um, any information. But then you can see the deep red. The deep red means that the country scores zero or 0 0.49, which means that they really and truly don't have much in the way of um, laws to um, um, protect um, workers in the workplace against sexual harassment. So it's unfortunate that my country, Ghana, um, is one of those um, that is colored red. And we find um, so it is um, for um, Nigeria. Um, but then when we, uh, um, we have two, no, Four countries that uh, have um, 2.5 to 3 means that they are, they are providing significant amount of um, protection um, um, across the different um, areas that we have um, identified. So one that stands out is Cote d'Ivoire and then um, Benin. And I think the other one um, is um, Rwanda. So you find that these countries then you could say have stronger, provide stronger protections against sexual harassment in the workplace than does the um, like um, of Ghana. In South Africa, we find that it's 1.5 to 1.99. So we would have to invest, um, go in and investigate and find out exactly what areas is South Africa providing some um, um, protection and then in what areas is um, South Africa um, lagging. So 
what I have given you here is the example looking at one policy area, which is sexual harassment um, in the workplace. Now, we've done this for all the eight policy areas that we were um, interested in. And so in blue, we are giving you the percentage of countries that you could say have domesticated because they have scores of two or more. And so we find that for child marriage, 67% of um, the countries in Africa, 36 of them, have in place strong laws to protect girls against um, child marriage. And when it comes to um, disability, women in disability, we find 33 countries, which translates to about 61%. We were looking at sexual harassment in the workplace. We find there's only 36 countries have, which have a score of um, two um, and above translating to only 19 countries which are providing some strong um, protections against sexual um, harassment. And where we do badly is in terms of laws um, to um, protect the rights of elderly women, where we only have 15 countries, no, 15% of countries translating to eight out of the 55 um, African countries that have laws that are providing some sort of protection um, to elderly women. So in conclusion of the Maputo protocols that we've looked at, um, some, con some um, provisions have been translated into national policy by the majority of African countries and um, others not. We find the protection against some forms of discrimination and disadvantage is not always comprehensive or complete, as the example of sexual harassment um, in the workplace um, shows. So this is preliminary work, and you could say we are just digging um, at the surface, but it's it's um, quite interesting and giving us some indication um, as to what protections um, are in place to um, provide for the uh, rights of African women. So there's more work that um, we would um, want to do. For example, mapping the domestication of the protocols against indicators such as the SDGs and other development outcomes, to analyze the impact of the law on outcomes such as female labor participation, women's hours of unpaid work, and dis disentangling the different provisions with regards to other policy dimensions, and analyzing in detail each of the policy provisions to understand the reasons why they progress or why they fail to progress. Why, why doesn't Ghana have stronger um, se um, sexual harassment and the workplace um, laws, but Cote d'Ivoire does? That is something um, that may be of um, interest to some of us. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. That was fascinating. Um, any questions either in person or online for Abena or Fabio? Robert. Okay, how, how about two questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. So my first question is a clarifying one. Um, in terms of the um, some of the characteristics that you showed us, um, I think you may, may, you may mention of the fact that um, Many of the countries do not have laws on sexual harassment, but also um, then you mentioned that the employer is responsible. So how do you reconcile that if there aren't laws, then who says the employer or how do you then gauge who is responsible? Is my first question. So let's do it one at a time because I haven't got anything to write down. So we find here that 40 countries, oh, yeah, 40. Is, I, I mentioned the 40 countries that don't have laws that require that the um, employer takes actions to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. So that country may have a law that's um, saying that sexual harassment in the workplace is prohibited. But when it comes to this requirement, if we truly want to be able to protect um, the women um, at the workplace, then we would require that the law also specifies that the employers must take action. Uh, so we are finding here that in 40 countries, there may be, there may be a law, but um, the law doesn't specify 
Okay. Yeah. But basically, so let's look here. So right at the bottom, prohibition of all forms of sexual and sex-based harassment. So it's 11 countries which don't have any such law. We have one country which has maybe got something on the books. We have 29 countries for which it is, there is some provision, but you could say it's incomplete. It's only 12 countries that provide full um, protections in terms of what they consider to be sexual harassment. Okay, is it clear now? So okay. then my second question yes. is as So do I need to? For the people online maybe? The question the question is for people are online. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so um is there any way of telling whether some form of productivity indicators are related to uh countries that take sexual harassment? That's um, our future work. The, okay. <laughs> okay. So right now we are laying the ground so that we know what the state of affairs uh, is. Then the next step is now to begin to understand you know, which countries, why, what are the outcome, what are the effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. That question has been studied in other countries mm -hmm. and has shown higher rates of absenteeism, lower rates of productivity, economic costs associated with it. But the work that ACER will be doing here would be um, groundbreaking work for studying it in Africa. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, mine is sort of like a clarification question. So I remember you said um, there's 11 countries that seem to not have any specific laws. And it goes back to what um, Fabio had spoken about, that out of the 55 member states, only uh, 44 actually ratified the Maputo Protocol. So is it as simple as saying that this 11 is the 11 that dovetails? And then secondly, is there sort of any political will from those countries to try and ratify some of these laws or what are the complexities there? Thank you. Okay, so the 11 is just coincidental. So um, probably as we um, write up our findings, we, we need to keep in mind that um, indeed you may find that some of those who haven't ratified are the ones who may probably have done it um, anyway. Uh, why haven't countries done it? Um, I, I remember reading about Botswana. Well, maybe I should be careful. Um, I may be wrong. But I remember um, reading about a country and when they were asked, it was in a report, why? There was no reason why they hadn't done it. They just hadn't. That was the response that was given. And so that also you could say would be another research work. Is there any political will um, for the Maputo Protocol. Well, the 44 have shown some um, political will. So you then ask yourself, and this is a question I can't answer, then can the AU say, look, you're member states of the AU and you know we've all agreed to this, so why don't you sign up? I'll leave that to the political scientists. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Anything online, Charmaine? Oh, yes, my sister. Are you going to reach out? He's going to ask. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I just want to know if in the research you are considering looking at the role of Maputo Protocol in, in areas of, of conflict. Because, for example, Mozambique has been in many conflicts and now for example we have terrorism and probably looking at how Maputo protocol can help to handle uh, inequality in the area where displacement people live would be a very interesting task. Thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, that is a very important question. It would mean then that we would need to have data 
um, on countries that may have translated those provisions into uh, national law, because you need that legal um, framework to give you the um, authority um, to be able then um, to um, implement and bring um, about change. So if we are able to get that data, then we should be able um, to consider what you are suggesting. So in this instance, it's a question of um, whether um, such data um, is available. But it's, the, I mean, to be honest with you, when I started this work, I think I was a little naive as to um, what was entailed, but um, it's quite a bit of, <laughs> it's quite a bit of work. So it's going to, you know, take a bit of time to go through what we've already done and then we can also proceed and uh, to look at um, other areas but it, it is an important point and i'm certain we, we might be able to get a you know, put together data that would allow us to do that sort of analysis thank you any other comments questions from in the room Line. No? Okay, if not, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you to the team for this amazing, inspiring work. Question? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yes. Um, well, the Maputo Protocol is interested in the rights of women, but when we are going to be conducting our analysis, you can see we are going in knowing full well that we can have instances of men being victims of sexual harassment. And um, if you should look at, for example, in Ghana, our DHS data, this is on intimate partner violence though, you, 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 we, we have statistics for men reporting um, intimate um, partner violence. So we may find in terms of the reportage that the incidence may be lower and the low incidence may also be because maybe men may be embarrassed to even admit that they are subject to um, sexual harassment. So it is an issue that uh, we are sensitive to and we don't go in thinking that it's only women who are um, victims of sexual harassment. Just to add one thing on that, online we do have data um, also on uh, which countries cover sexual harassment, not only against women and against men, but also by whom. You know, so do they cover same sex sexual harassment as well as different sex sexual harassment? And the other thing I want to mention is that um, this new data isn't yet online, but uh, much of the data is freely downloadable. So if you just go to worldpolicycenter.org, there's a table of contents and you can find where you can either download full data sets or you can find maps that can be shared or turn into PowerPoints or use freely in any way. Thank you, that's great to know. Okay, closing for real this time. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for being here and being online. And can we just give one more round of applause to our presenters?